Hello and welcome to Festival of Ideas Online. I'm Andrew Kelly, Director of Festival of Ideas. Mariana Matsukatu is Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London, where she's Founding Director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She's the winner of many international prizes, was named as one of the three most important thinkers about innovation by the New Republic, and one of the 25 leaders shaping the future of capitalism by Wired. Her books include The Entrepreneurial State and The Value of Everything. We've done events on both and we'll post links to these on our website. We're looking today at her new book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. Some of this book is based on her role as an advisor to policymakers around the world on innovation-led, inclusive and sustainable growth, including the Scottish Government, the South African President's Economic Advisory Council, Norway's Research Council, and she was also special advisor to the EC, EC Commissioner for Research, Science and Innovation, where she wrote the report, Mission Oriented Research and Innovation in the European Union. Mariana, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be back. Can we talk, start talking about what a mission economy is? Sure. I mean, first of all, you know, one can use the word mission to mean all sorts of different things. And so in some ways, I must say, I regretted putting the word moonshot <laughs> into the title of the book because that as well can be seen as different things. It could just be interpreted as like a big project, right? You know, is HS2 a moonshot in the UK? So really what missions and the concept of moonshot are, at least in my book, where they're both in the title and the subtitle, it's a way to actually make sure that the role of the state and hence of policy and the design of policy is actually focused on goals. It's focused on getting stuff done that matters. And you know, one of the first things I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute is who decides what's important to get done. But first, let me just kind of backtrack in terms of just realizing how different this is from what we currently do. Whether you think about industrial strategy, innovation policy, development policy, different domains of you know, state um, action, uh, it's often kind of a handout, <laughs> a subsidy, a guarantee of some sort to a type of sector, a type of technology, a type of company, whether it's a small, medium enterprise or some sort of strategic state-owned enterprise. And the idea is, let's not do that. Let's stop doing that. Let's stop making random lists of sectors, technologies, firms, or any kind of unit to be supported. And let's think of what are we actually trying to do? You know, if we're going to, you know, battle climate change, what does it actually mean to focus on climate related targets like in a city, a carbon neutral city? If we're interested in, you know, all the SDGs, just think about the one that's about life underwater. What does it mean to transform that into a really concrete goal, like getting the plastic out within a limited time period and to be, ab and to be able to actually answer yes or no, did you do it? Right. So missions are about kind of you know, really strategic and also inspirational goals, but that you can also answer, was the mission completed or not? And secondly, getting as many different actors in the system. So instead of making this random list of, oh, this is going to be all about SMEs, or this is about, you know, getting consulting companies to help, or this is about, you know, the big society, and it's just about civil society organizations. How can you get all sorts of uh, organizations and the public, private, and the third sector part of the solutions, the experimentation, the trial and error and error to actually solving the biggest problems that we have around, again, climate inequality or whatever it may be underneath. I keep, I'm going to keep coming back to the SDGs. Um, and so it's not about, again, a project, you know, even the cancer mission, if there was one, it's not just about the healthcare sector and, you know, drugs or chemotherapy, you know, techniques. It is also about that wider uh, set of actors that would be required, for example, in preventing people from getting cancer in the first place. Or if you think of a future mobility mission underneath some sort of, uh, again, climate slash transport uh, 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 challenge area, what does it mean to bring construction, uh, you know, new types of financial services, new types of nutrition, new types of mobility systems together in order to actually, you know, think about that problem. And the, the second word I wanted to just ask you about is, is, the, is the use of the term value. What, what are we measuring here? 
Well, so in my previous book, not this book, called The Value of Everything, one of the things I argued is that we keep confusing value with price, right? So we get this tautology that we end up valuing um, only those areas that have uh, uh, not only managed to get a price, but for example, that are, if you look at workers, earning a lot of money. So this is why uh, Lloyd Blankfein, the head of Goldman Sachs, one year after the financial crisis, had the guts to say, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. And he didn't say it as a joke. He was serious. And, he, and he's correct in terms of if you think of how we measure productivity output per input, if we don't know how to actually measure the output and value the output, for example, of our public health services, public education, and we only look at the input, so the cost of those services, that's why we often think of the cost of public services and not actually the value of what they're producing because we haven't managed to put a price, <laughs> a value on this, you know, on a well-structured uh, public education system. Um, we haven't valued it in our GDP simply because it doesn't have a price. Anyway, so when we confuse price with value, we get all sorts of problems. But also, if you come back to value creation as an activity, and really recognize how value is in fact created collectively. Just look at everything we have you know, outside of our windows, whether we look at infrastructure, but also the whole IT revolution required all sorts of different actors to make that happen, both the public and the private domain. And yet we haven't valued, and this again goes back to my other book, The Entrepreneurial State, uh, the role of the public sector as part of that. The public sector is often just seen as enabling someone else to create value facilitating, de-risking, de-risking who? The risk takers um, or fixing market failure. So the market is out there. Sometimes it screws up, it screws up big time and the state has to come in to fix those different problems. So value, it's, it's not just about accounting for value in GDP in the way that many feminist economists and environmental economists have told us is problematic, but also really going back to the core, the first principles of how is wealth even created? How is value created? And if we have a really siloed understanding of that, which is dismissed the enormous effort of lots of different actors that are not just in the business sector, we have a problem. And, you know, the whole notion of missions, especially, you know, if you start off with a kind of Apollo mission, as I do in the book, that required huge amounts of both private and public investment. It wasn't the public sector facilitating, you know, the Boeings of this world. It was actually very much about directing the show and then really catalyzing as many different actors to be part of that process, including the public investment itself. And so what does that look like if we apply it to some of our societal challenges in terms of you know, public-private partnerships that are truly about not just risk sharing, but also reward sharing, truly about co-investing, and also about really paying a lot of attention to the design of the partnership, the design of the co-investment, and the design of the risk sharing. I mean, when I mean, we were predominantly in the arts and culture and the issue of value there is is one that is debated endlessly, not just in terms of economic value, which tends to be a bit more uh, less in terms of importance now, I find, but in terms of the social impact that you can have and indeed the cultural impact, however you measure that. Yeah. And in fact, we've just done a report. Um, I'm sure I'll start uh, name dropping a bunch of different reports that we've done. This one is not in the book. It's not one of the ones that I kind of go over and talk about the kind of memoirs of, of getting the job done. But a new report that we did for the BBC, which is, you know, a cultural institution um, in the creative sector. And it's so interesting. Uh, sorry, a report on public value. And what does it mean to also talk about values collectively created, but also in the process of creating it, what is public value as an internal metric also of accountability look like. And it's just so interesting to me because the BBC has actually that notion of public value, you'll know. Um, and yet it's not really talked about. It's not also shared with other, you know, creative institutions. So I've just been speaking to Francis Morris at the Tate Modern. What would the notion of public value look like in a museum like the Tate Modern in terms of thinking about its audience, in terms of thinking about you know, art, literally, like which artists and, and you know, that broader notion of, of the artistic community, but also what is the role of the public museum today uh, in terms of its own um, role in that collective creation uh, process. But in the BBC work, it was interesting because many public broadcasters around the world do actually accept this notion that you're there just to fix market failure. So PBS, public broadcasting, in the US, it's excellent. When I used to live in the US, that's you know, the only news I watched was PBS because it was so high quality. They also had great documentaries and so on, but that's all they did. They did high quality news and documentaries basically, right? So they didn't dare 
to delve into the areas that would be more traditionally seen as just for the commercial sector. Think of talk shows, soap operas. What the BBC did was to say, hold on a second, there's no limited space where we're allowed to operate. What should be limited is how we do it. We have to be purpose oriented, public value oriented, regardless of the format, literally the format, whether it's a soap opera or a talk show. So they redefined the soap opera away from Dallas and Dynasty, basically stories about the 1% <laughs> towards EastEnders, you know, soap operas about the working class, which, you know, at the time was really, really, you know, a, a path breaking. Now we all think it's normal. It wasn't normal. So you needed a public broadcaster to redefine the market. And if you do it in an ambitious way, in a mission oriented way, you end up benefiting the private sector because you create a new space that they can be, and I don't like this word, but I'll say it crowded into, right? So you crowd in private activity into a new area that has new opportunities for everyone. And yet we don't understand that, you know, like we continue to then blame the BBC that you're crowding out business, become smaller, just do high quality news and documentaries when we don't realize that that in fact, you know, that is the origin of its success. The fact that actually it hasn't limited itself, which doesn't mean it should just do everything and it should kind of take over the whole broadcasting market, but it does mean that it then requires intra organizational metrics to make sure it's actually satisfying the public purpose kind of criteria for its existence. I mean, that's going to be incredibly valuable, I think, to the work we do. And, and you know, we look forward to that very much. The, the, the core mission oriented project you talk about in the book, you've mentioned already the Apollo mission. So I don't want you to go through that again. But a, a few of the lessons which come out of that and, and the ones main ones for me were issues around leadership, around organisation and around the fact that the kind of spillover effects that happen through this kind of, of project. Could you take us through a, a couple of those for us? Sure. I mean, the, the big lessons really are, first of all, you know, in the famous speeches that Kennedy, uh, you know, had in the early 60s, it, it, it was very much, we're going to do this because it's hard, not because it's easy. And yet all the policymaking language we have today is about facilitating some sort of other actor, which means making things easier, right? So the kind of recognition that the challenges that we have ahead, again, around climate and equality, strengthening health services are hard. They are difficult and we need to welcome also the uncertainty and that difficulty into the storytelling itself of what we're doing, as opposed to saying, no, we're going to do this and it's going to be, you know, a linear process and it won't cost too much and we're going to kind of facilitate others to get the job done, right? I mean, that's, that's basically the, the policy language we, use, we usually hear. So the recognition is going to be hard, that it will cost a lot of money, but it's worth it. Now, was it worth it or not? That's not me to decide, but, you know, if we have democratic also institutions thinking of today's challenges that we have that can also bring consensus to particular areas that we think are important. And again, every country has signed up to the sustainable development goals, which I do believe should be framing at least what we think the big challenges are. Um, then what does it mean to really kind of lead on those challenges, transform them into missions and admit that they're gonna be hard. Second, the kind of level of experimentation and risk taking was enormous. Um, and that was, again, welcome, but also it meant failure, trial and error and error. You know, the kind of Apollo 1 tragedy where those three astronauts uh, uh, were killed was absolutely tragic. But unfortunately, that's, that is part of the process. And it doesn't mean you kind of go after that failure, but it means you have to also learn from that failure. And the learning that occurred after the Apollo 1 tragedy was very interesting. They realized, for example, that their own organization was too top down, too siloed, something we know many government departments are. They all work within their silos. And so George Mueller from Bell Labs, which is a famous uh, private innovation laboratory inside AT&T, came into NASA on the back of that fire um, and you know, helped NASA reorganize its structure to be much more horizontal, agile, flexible with different project managers all having their teams, but with that need to constantly communicate between them. And by the way, Gus Grissom, one of the astronauts who died before dying on that tragic day, 1967, said, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? We can't talk between two or three teams because he couldn't hear what was being said to him in the mission control room. And so that kind of, you know, welcoming of the risk and the experimentation because they actually didn't know how to get to the moon. <laughs> Originally, they figured it out uh, with the um, lunar orbit rendezvous method, but also that need to change the organizational structure to be also a risk-taking, purpose-oriented one that fostered constant horizontal communication. That was very important. And then, as you said, you know, this wasn't just about aeronautics um, and, and aerospace. There was lots of different 
uh, industries involved from nutrition, electronics, the whole software industry could be seen as a spillover from that, uh, from that project and lots of different uh, innovations that came about along the way in a serendipitous way. So camera phones, uh, baby formula, home insulation are all kind of you know, spillovers from that uh, mission. So it's not just mission accomplished, it's how do you actually set up then these kind of broad intersectoral missions, I, I mentioned some of the sectors that were involved, to also then welcome bottom-up experimentation, right? So very clear on the what needs to get done, but keeping open the how and getting lots of different actors involved. Um, and they had kind of outcomes-oriented budgeting and outcomes-oriented procurement policy. That would be kind of the fifth big area. So even the procurement, for example, that they had at the time, which was based on cost plus contracts, they had to change that because they felt that that was just elevating public costs without really, again, getting the job done. Uh, so they changed it to fixed price contracts. Uh, very clear, again, on the what needed to be done. The fixed price could almost be interpreted like a prize scheme in the procurement, but then with constant incentives for in innovation and quality improvement. And that's, in fact, what then created the incentives for, you know, the business sector when it did get involved to, um, you know, to do better than just a linear kind of static contract would uh, allow them to do, and also not just to charge NASA any amount, but you know, it had to remain confined, but then you got extra if you did really well. And that attention to design that NASA put into those contracts, they even you know, put in a, a no excess profits clause, which again, I found so interesting when I was doing the research because it doesn't mean anything to talk about collective value creation and you know, co-creation if then the profits all go private. So this idea that this is gonna really be done together, public and private, requiring lots of investment and risk taking by both. And so we should make sure that you don't get excess profits in the private sector because you, know, you get your fair share and not more because there's other actors in the system. You know, wouldn't that be great if we did that today? Um, and also something that the uh, head of procurement, Ernest Brackett did, which I found really interesting, was he was very clear that in order to be successful, NASA had to know which companies to even work with. They couldn't just, you know, do the kind of thing we're seeing is happening today in the UK government, which is, you know, just fund your family and friends <laughs> uh, with, uh, with contracts during COVID. Um, so he said, one of the first things is we ourselves within NASA have to remain really kind of intelligent and on the frontier of the science. So we can't just outsource all the R&D, even though a private sector R&D unit might be helping us. We ourselves need to be thinking of our own dynamic capabilities and capacity within the state. So you'll remember that Lord Agnew, a Tory Lord, recently said that he looked at all the consulting uh, contracts that both Brexit and COVID kind of brought into the UK government, which is pretty normal nowadays. He said that is making us stupid, that is infantilizing, he said Whitehall. So, you know, Ernest Brackett was very aware that that infantilization of NASA or public servants would lead to what he called, and get this, he said, capture by brochuremanship. They didn't have PowerPoints at the time you know, all these PowerPoints we all use. They had these sexy brochures that companies might come in and show, you know, the public sector, hey, work with us. He said, no, we need to work with the top companies, not because of some sexy brochure, but we won't know, you know, how to write the terms of reference or how to choose those companies if we don't know what we're doing. Um, anyway, so all those, you know, different lessons, I think, are so, so interesting, you know, leadership, experimentation, risk-taking, intra-organizational agility and flexibility, symbiotic, mutualistic public-private partnerships, not parasitic ones, and the confidence within the state, but also the investment within the public sector in its own ability to co-create value, what I call the dynamic capabilities of the public sector. All these are, of course, important today. And however, the challenges we have today are harder than getting to the moon. They're not technocratic challenges. They're deeply wicked, requiring social, behavioral, political, regulatory change. But those lessons there are just as important. Because, and again, just look at what we're learning along the way with COVID-19. A lot of those lessons are, are super relevant, but we should be careful not to treat our societal challenges as though they were purely technocratic. And that's where some of the interesting stuff comes in, which I reflect on the book on, you know, what the differences are, in fact, with social challenges. I want to come on to those after this next question, in fact, but just a comment on what you've just said. I mean, I, as I read the book, I kept reflecting on lots of the work we've done in Bristol, you know, not just on... Um, in, in culture, actually, but also, you know, we did a lot of work, for example, on the engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel and what he achieved. And, you know, one of the things which was 
he was accused of was that he was costly in the work he did. But when he died, his great friend, the, the engineer Daniel Gooch said, you know, great things are not done by those who sit down and count the cost of every act. And, um, and similarly, coming through to, you know, the Bristol Aeroplane Company, which started in 1910, making planes out of wood and glue and paper, um, and went on to build Concord and so on, which you do mention in the book, some of the, 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 the spillovers from those kind of projects as well, which was certainly not uh, thought about at, at the time. Um, we, we're in a crisis though, aren't we? Because at the same time as we need a strong public sector, uh, strong government, uh, innovative government and so on, we, we, we don't have that in some respects. And also we've got capitalism in major crisis now, um, you know, whether it's productivity or it's inability to deal with some of these big issues. And you're talking about not just the reinvention of government, are you? But you're also talking about the reinvention of capitalism here. Yes, because, I mean, you know, the economy is an outcome of how we organize all the institutions and organizations in our, you know, society. So if we misgovern the public organizations and think they are, again, just about fixing markets at best, they will always be too little too late. If we allow private organizations to be organized just by maximizing shareholder value, which it doesn't have to be, you know, we know there's other ways to organize corporate governance around deep issues around a uh, stakeholder value or look at global cooperatives, you know, we will also have problems. And if the interrelationship between, uh, you know, a shareholder value maximizing company and a market fixing uh, a public sector organization is itself problematic. So the partnership is kind of doomed to fail because of both the intra organizational problems, but also the inter organizational systems and contracts being problematic, then we get the wrong kind of capitalism. So there's nothing deterministic about the kind of capitalism we have. It has, it's very much an outcome of these intra and inter-organizational questions. And so by unpicking what it means to be a, a purpose-oriented private institution, a mission-oriented public institution, and for the relationship to be mutualistic and symbiotic and not parasitic and predator-prey, <laughs> which I would argue we do have in areas like the health sector, you know, that is about rethinking capitalism or doing capitalism differently because there are varieties of capitalism. And, you know, there's a whole literature on varieties of capitalism, but I don't think we have then put it into practice. And what the book tries to do in a kind of unashamed way, because academics aren't supposed to really do this, is to almost make it into a recipe book. Like, all right, let's get serious. You know, let's stop just blabbing and talking about the SDGs. What would it look like to put you know, sustainability and inclusion kind of challenges at the center of policy design with that mission oriented approach. Let's look at this, whether it's at the city level, at the national, at the regional in particular areas, what would it mean in terms of doing things differently from how we're doing it now? Because if we just use the word purpose, mission, sustainability, but keep doing the same thing, just covered with beautiful new words, <laughs> you know, that's a scam. Now, one of the, the I mean, the moonshot was criticized at the time and you, you talk about this in the book by you know it was great to be able to put someone on the moon but it didn't solve the the problems of the ghettos in the united yeah. states and so on and and it's that big you know how how difficult is it on turning some of these the the idea of the moonshot for a, a technological solution in that sense into one that deals with these kind of wicked problems that you you talk about and perhaps we could talk about a couple of them the, obviously the one is one of these is climate change mm -hmm. and the environmental crisis and i did like the way you rewrote kennedy's speech in the book to <laughs> to reflect the you know it, we do it not because it's um i'd have to read the whole yeah. speech out actually but <laughs> we might put it up uh, as a link to this event and the second one is is one that keeps being kicked into the long grass really which is social care and you cover right. aspects of this within with your book. So when it comes to, to climate change then, um, what would a, a mission-oriented government do and how would that work with the private sector? So first of all, because I sometimes forget to say this as much as I think it should be said, <laughs> um, you know, if we look at, because we used the word capitalism before, the big improvements in capitalism often occurred through battles, right? You know, we have the weekend, <laughs> we have the eight hour workday. Children are not working in factories because of the labor movement. People died for those things. People even died to get, you know, construction workers to have construction hats. So that things that fall on their head 
don't kill them, right? We just see construction workers with those, but people died. <laughs> they fought battles, right, for those kinds of uh, uh, wins. So the first thing is, you know, that's a huge difference. A lot of the, the kind of, you know, SDG related, sustainable development goal related targets that we have around hunger, around equality, gender parity, around climate, and so on, you know, also require a battle <laughs> on the field. Um, and in an era where we have the Black Lives Matter movement, the Fridays for the Future movement, the Me Too movement, I think this is actually a great moment to be talking about how to make sure that it isn't, it doesn't just turn into some sort of technocratic, you know, uh, climate uh, solution where you have a bunch of academics like me, you know, some scientists talking about the kind of science side and, you know, some great policymakers in a room in the kind of Davos jet set kind of way. This does require, you know, a, a proper, real, not tokenistic uh, uh, kind of co-creation moment where we have different voices at the table, even defining what we even mean by sustainability. What does it mean to live together in a more sustainable way? Um, now, in a more kind of practical uh, way, um, what it means to put climate change, and we should call it global warming, because change could be kind of this neutral change, whatever, <laughs> global warming is, is what we're seeing out there. Just think of the fires that are uh, ripping across uh, BC and Canada, British Columbia, this week. Um, what, it, what it offers us, a mission-oriented approach, is to kind of really focus on um, what the actual goal is. So for example, we worked with Manchester with Andy Burnham's team, by we, I mean the institute that I run at University College London, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, in trying to help bring this kind of notion of missions to the center of how the city was thinking about its kind of climate uh, targets. And you know, that really required bringing lots of different act actors together from manufacturing, construction, health, education, environment, energy, transport, digital and media. You know, those were all sorts of different sectors, including also civil society sectors uh, at the table, but also putting kind of citizens at the core of that. So one of the, the, the objectives of the Manchester work was to really look at a citizen's life from, in Man and by citizen, I mean people who live in a city, I shouldn't use the word citizenship uh, nowadays. <laughs> uh, I mean it in an Aristotelian sense. Um, so, you know, what does your life look like literally from when you wake up to when you go to bed if we have kind of sustainability targets throughout the day? Um, you know, what does it mean for school meals that are delivered to children in schools? That, by the way, we were inspired by the mission in Sweden, where Sweden currently has a very high level mission of a fossil free welfare state, which then lands in very concrete ways around public transport, public education, public health, and in public education, that school meal mission that they had, which was to make sure that school meals were, are uh, healthy, uh, tasty, not just Ikea meatballs, uh, and sustainable. So you look at the whole value chain of production of school meals, but also get kids involved in that process, you know, helping to think about you know, healthy, tasty, sustainable meals also through their curriculum, being active agents in that process. And you know, it just occurred to me recently, think of Marcus Rashford's you know, battle, again, battles, <laughs> uh, movements, to get school meals to be funded also during the lockdown to make sure that children who um, also were in theory on holiday, even though nothing felt like a holiday during the pandemic, were still given their you know, free school meals. What if that kind of uh, uh, social mission, which has a lot to do with distribution, also had within it a funnel for sustainable innovation? So you provide not only school meals to make sure that they're always available, as Marcus Rashford did, and he should be so applauded for that, but also make sure that the school meal itself is as healthy and sustainable and tasty as possible. You know, again, that means grounding these kind of high level, you know, uh, 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 sometimes abstract feeling goals into the very kind of nitty gritty of the everyday. Um, and, you know, but it also includes, you know, having different types of services. So what are the new types of services, even insurance services or, um, you know, carbon ID cards, you know, if we wanted to start thinking of all the uh, different ways in which having kind of carbon neutral living would be embodied in our, you know, not just manufacturing what we make, but also literally how we are serviced and how we service all the different types of industries actually, which need to fundamentally transform. That's another thing I should probably say that one of the points of mission oriented policies is about transformation. So in the beginning, I said less about handouts, guarantees and subsidies, but to make sure you have transformation, we need conditionality. 
right? So I was very interested recently where, um, sorry, when uh, in Germany, because they had a very high level energy Wende mission, which was all about um, carbon neutrality, the way that their own public bank called the KFW interacted with different types of sectors, including old sectors like steel, fundamentally changed and it required those sectors to change in order to access the subsidy. And the steel sector, even in the UK, is asking for handouts all the time because it's in crisis, but the KFW put the condition that the steel sector had to lower its material content in order to access a public loan. And they did that through repurpose, reuse, recycle technology throughout their whole value chain. They today have the greenest, most sustainable steel production in the world, not because they went to Davos and talked about stakeholder value or purpose, but because they had to in order to access even just one euro of public subsidy. And we didn't do that here, right? You know, we just go from bailout to bailout or even during the recovery. It's been so interesting to see how some countries have put conditionality, green conditionality at the center of the COVID-19 recovery funds and others haven't. So in France, the finance minister uh, uh, made both Renault, the car manufacturer, and Air France commit to lowering their carbon emissions in order to access the French COVID recovery um, finance. Whereas here, we just gave EasyJet, you know, a lot of money for free and <laughs> said, you know, do what you need to do. Um, and that doesn't get you transformation. So conditionality, less about kind of just a stick, but also as a true kind of carrot and sort of stick in order to really co-create a different type of economy. If I can use the words that everyone's using now, build back better. Building back better doesn't happen unless it's nested within the contracts. And so again, a mission-oriented approach to those contracts focuses on the goal and makes sure that any subsidy guarantee, public loan bailout, recovery fund will be designed in such a way to actually get that mission accomplished. I, I want to come back to social care in a moment, but I, I, I would oh, yeah, sorry. the interest, no, don't, don't, the interest uh, one of the interesting case studies in, in the book is about the work you've been doing in Camden. Mm. And, um, you know, not just in terms of, you know, with, with the council and so on, but with, with, the, with the estates, with, you, you talk about the involvement of George the poet and so on. Um, yeah. What value has that provided to, to the work you're doing? Huge. In fact, I just tweeted, I think, this weekend. I, my kids keep saying, Mom, think before you tweet. Uh, <laughs> um, some, some wonderful walkabouts that I've been doing with Georgia Gould, who I um, co-chair the Camden Renewal Commission with, um, precisely in actually getting to know the people, the, you know, the real change makers on the ground that in Camden have been, again, battling out the good fight for quite some time. And what does it look like to actually bring together a lot of these different initiatives whether it's the food cooperatives, the kind of youth center uh, uh, movement to really make youth centers the best that the 21st century can offer um, and, and all sorts of different initiatives in Camden together so that we actually get you know, the sum of the parts to be kind of going uh, towards transformational change. And, and Camden is just so interesting because in some ways it's a microcosm of what we have all over the world, which is incredible opportunity and kind of knowledge, you know, the whole knowledge economy in Camden sitting side by side with extreme deprivation, right? So we have the Knowledge Quarter, UCL, my own university is part of that, British Library, British Museum, the Crick Center, the Wellcome Trust, we could go on and on. And this is literally the best that the 21st century can offer. Again, living side by side to Summerstown, which has been, you know, incredibly problematic in terms of poverty, in terms of youth crime, deprivation, in terms of also cuts to different types of services that have mainly been fed by the last kind of 10 years of austerity. But of course, the, you know, the problems there predate the austerity itself. So, you know, this is something we have in many different cities, whether we look at New York, Delhi, and so on, incredible opportunity around finance and digital services and science. And yet we don't solve, as, as you were mentioning before, uh, I think you were, um, uh, indirectly uh, uh, recollecting um, Jill Scott Heron's poem, which I talk about in the book, you know, getting whitey on the moon, where he's like, you know, great, sounds great to get on the moon, but what about this extreme deprivation and racism and, and all sorts of different problems around poverty that we have on earth? What does that look like to, to actually pay attention to those problems with that equal level of urgency? So what we've done in Camden is we have brought the community together through different civil society organizations, but especially also Camden Council and all those different departments, right? Uh, so that they're not working in silos, as I was saying in the beginning, when NASA realized that if it was going to be purpose-oriented, it had to stop working in its own silo. 
and to ask what would it look like to have missions that are again about about food and making sure that everyone in Camden has access to healthy, sustainable uh, food, and again to position those kind you know that mission itself also not only within school meals but also into an urban food. Uh, movement. We just went to visit different types of um, food cooperatives, but also something called the Refugee Kitchen the other day. And again, bringing together those people that have been thinking about food as, as a human right, but also food as more than just making sure people have meals, but also as one of the funnels for innovation in Camden to make sure that these meals are as, uh, as healthy and sustainable as possible. We have one of the missions around youth crime. You'll know that, you know, knife crime in London, but also across the UK has been going up. What does it mean to bring youth together to actually not only talk about those problems, but find solutions together in terms of, again, making sure we have not only spaces like youth centers, but really that those spaces be the best, <laughs> as I said, that the 21st century can offer interlinked with these great knowledge economy institutions, but not in terms of just handouts where you might have Google, which also you know, sits in Camden. We have Google, Facebook, YouTube, all sitting on the grounds and paying business rates in Camden. What does it mean to actually make sure the relationship is not sort of a condescending one where maybe an app or some coding classes are given to the youth centers, but we really turn them into, along with public libraries and community centers, again, the best <laughs> that the 21st century should be able to offer our youth given, you know, the, the technological um, opportunities that we have. But if people don't, as Amartya Sen would always say or always says that, you know, it doesn't make sense to talk about opportunities if you don't have those basic capabilities. And if we're not investing in our youth, we're not investing in the social structures and the social infrastructure, including you were talking before about social care, then there's no point in talking about, you know, uh, digital technology, globalization and all these great things if, if people have not been allowed to kind of prosper in terms of the investments that we're making. Um, we've also been looking at carbon neutrality kinds of missions through housing estates. So, you know, um, bringing, uh, resident associations and citizen assemblies to the table to actually talk about sustainable living. So again, it's less of a top down, oh, we're going to make all our, you know, housing estates sustainable. What does it mean to, again, bring people living in the housing estates to be co-creators of that mission itself and to actually start off by asking what does it mean actually to live together in a more sustainable way, as well as what are the new skills that are required? What is the new physical and social infrastructure that's required both within and around our housing estates to make that happen. Um, and I could go on, but really I've just found it so inspiring because first of all, there's so much activity already on the ground in Camden and yet we do ha still have so many of these problems. So bringing them together in new ways that really do create that additionality, making things happen that wouldn't have had happened anyway is really important but also making sure that the relationship that Camden has with the business sector, I already mentioned Google, which has its headquarters, you'll know in Granary Square, which is in, you know, just behind King's Cross in Camden, to make sure that that relationship is, you know, using the word I said before, symbiotic and mutualistic and not parasitic. What does it mean maybe to have a wealth fund, for example, a public wealth fund in Camden, using the business rates that are coming from those kind of companies, but also an extra amount that they should be putting in because they are benefiting from this incredible social and you know, infrastructure, knowledge corridor and so on that surrounds them. Um, and also, you know, not through kind of a charitable arm, but kind of as a recognition of paying into um, this kind of collective social infrastructure that they're benefiting from. And what does it mean to set up a wealth fund, which then has a portfolio approach, this is what we've been talking about, to make sure that the wealth that is created in Camden, and there's a huge amount of wealth created in Camden, is also reinvested back into the community. This, by the way, is something that George the Poet has been uh, working on with us. He's also doing a PhD. I'm supervising him at UCL around this topic, but we brought him in to the Camden Removal Commission as a commissioner. Um, we have people from all sorts of different uh, walks of life, and he really was central for also bringing the creative sector uh, in, but also his own understanding, <clears throat> which I think is so central, which is imagine if we actually started to value hip hop and rap in this kind of immense creative output that is produced globally by people living precisely in places like Camden's housing estates. And yet that wealth, when it's created, does not get invested back in. You know, you have kind of a, a winner take all kind of dynamic where one in, you know, a million rappers become very uh, famous, but all the different structures around them that also allowed, 
that success to be had, often it's kind of just the record companies or particular types of companies that, you know, will benefit immensely, of course, individuals as well as they should. But what does it mean to kind of recognize whether it's, you know, the roundhouse in Camden or the different types of, you know, public education programs and to increase the recognition within our own curriculum and public education of that kind of music and that kind of creativity as part of a wealth creation process, but also to set up new types of contracts. Think of those cooperative models I alluded to before to make sure that as this incredible, you know, trillion dollar industry uh, thrives, that we make sure that the people and the communities on the ground that have, you know, created it, because again, not just the individuals that make the millions, you know, uh, the Jay-Z's and so on, but that those communities also are benefiting from that value that's created. So anyway, I, I didn't explain it very well, but his PhD is going to be fantastic. And it's looking precisely at the kind of value creation, value extraction, value redistribution kind of issues that the hip hop community uh, and rap community would benefit from. One proposal in Bristol recently was from the band Massive Attack who suggested having a, effectively creating, if I understood it right, the, the whole city as a business improvement district, of which some that income would go into supporting um, arts and cultural projects, of, of some of the kinds you, you've talked about. Two, two other questions, just to finish off. The first is about social care, because this is an issue which keeps being, it's a troubled issue for government. They, nobody seems to be able to deal with this. Um, obviously, it needs a big decision to be made. Well, you've done work on this. You, you, you know, your book includes mission maps on things like um, how to, you know, to um, on the dementia crisis and so on. What, what, what would a mission-oriented approach to this really, really try to do? So I'm, I'm hardly an expert on social care, so I'll just, you know, maybe give some insights from the work that I've done. I mean, the first is to value that care. You know, I mean, we clapped or healthcare workers on Thursdays or whichever day of the week people did around the world, and yet we're not valuing that work. And so I think there is a, a moment right now, the kind of COVID moment has woken us up to so many things, but one of the things is if, if we're using the word essential workers, what does it mean to actually treat them as essential in terms of how we you know, uh, uh, invest in that work, invest in the people doing the work, but also the the system around them, but also how we account for it, literally coming back to the metrics of, of growth and GDP and so on. And, and we have problems across all those different areas. And, and I know this weekend there was um, you know, uh, a demonstration in center of London by healthcare workers about the you know, tiny pay increase that they've received on the back of two years of you know, a huge sacrifice. And so the first is to make sure that we're not just using the word mission to talk about say a healthcare goal, but again, backtracking, as I was saying before about that kind of intra-organizational questions that we should be asking. And, and I think we have huge problems in the healthcare sector, which is one of those that we have over relied on outsourcing. And, and you know, outsourcing itself is not a problem, but when you start outsourcing, as I often say, the brain of the organizations that are supposed to be you know, uh, managing and governing a problem, then you do have big issues. And so, you know, one thing is that, of course, you need the private sector to help in all sorts of different care and, and health areas, but under what guidance? What is the direction? What is the goal? What is the goal that we actually have for our healthcare system? And then you can contract in perhaps, you know, some private companies to help out with that goal, but we've allowed the private sector to define the goal itself. Basically, I actually think that's happening in space today. You know, space today, unlike in the Apollo 1 program, has lots of, uh, um, or I should say, in the Apollo program, we had, as I mentioned already, lots of private activity, but it was directed by NASA. The contracts were very well defined on what it meant to actually get the job done. Today, we have lots of private sector companies in space creating huge amounts of debris. So the astronauts are saying, we can't see anything, because the goal itself seems to have been commercialization. Mm -hmm. Just, pr you know, provide an opportunity for private sector companies to play in space, the Elon Musk's on the back of huge amounts of public support, by the way, the Richard Branson's without the goal, like what's the goal? What are we even trying to do together? So in the health care sector and the social care sector, the first thing is what is the goal? What kind of social care do we want? What kind of health care system do we want? And that has to be publicly led. And then if you want to bring in different types of organizations to help you get it done, fine. But if it's not clear what you're trying to do and the contracts themselves don't have that really strong uh, uh, conditionality, 
of having to deliver based on these publicly set goals that have to do in the end with inclusion, democracy, sustainability, then you're just going to have a huge crisis on your hand. And it's amazing how in so many different parts of the world, the, um, you know, um, uh, some, some care units, and especially for the elderly, were really at the center of the crisis. And if you look at how they were structured, and in many in the UK, many of these care homes are actually run by private equity companies. I mean, how far away from a publicly kind of purpose-oriented, you know, agenda is that? So private equity companies running our care homes and also having so little technology and scientific expertise within them, right? These are, again, you know, units that are hardly, as I was saying with youth centers and public libraries, hardly being the best that the 21st century can offer. You can start unpicking lots of those different questions and transform the way we approach not just care homes, but social care and health care in a much more kind of target goal oriented way where that goal has to be people centered about what we actually think it means to be invested in as a human being with your rights, your human rights kind of at the center of that design process itself. And then the final question is about the role of cities. I mean, there's a lot of reliance on cities trying to solve some of these wicked problems at a time when resources are incredibly tight. I mean, in Bristol, you know, some of the work you described happening in Camden, the, the mayor here, when, when he was elected um, a few years ago, uh, set up something called the city office, which brought together, you know, businesses, um, the, the emergency services, civil society, uh, and so on, to, to try and help plan better for, for the city in the future. But cities are going to be critical to this, aren't they? And, and, and not just cities, but, but mayors as well, uh, as you described with your work for Andy Burnham, for example. Yes, I mean, what's interesting about cities is that they often are then at the front of, you know, of, of combating <laughs> uh, the challenges that we have. Think of, you know, again, the climate crisis and how it's being experienced in cities worldwide, um, but also with the uh, healthcare crisis and the COVID crisis, the way that cities then have to very quickly interact. In Camden, for example, all homeless people were actually taken off the street during COVID. We realized that could be done. Why is it just done during you know, a health pandemic? Um, and the experience that Camden had in that process, specifically with homeless people, was so interesting because they ended up learning so much about what it meant to also have people in need and homeless people have so many different needs and to receive their needs and their human rights all in one place. So there were certain hotels in Camden that ended up housing homeless people and all the different services that normally people would have to access in lots of different buildings, lots of different forms. Everything was brought in this kind of one-stop shop. And you know, the immense learning of that for the welfare state, if we started to scale up some of that learning, not just during a health pandemic, but to be the kind of normal user-friendly way as opposed to the way that we see in Ken Loach films where it just becomes you know, incredibly depressing and condescending and kind of killing of your inner soul when you're accessing some of these uh, badly uh, um, distributed and designed welfare services. Anyway, so I think what's interesting with cities is that so many of the problems that we can talk about globally and nationally are just so much more concrete in a city. If you think of a mobility strategy, getting from point A to point B and not just thinking about getting there quicker, but actually experiencing you know, that travel in a more inspirational way. This, by the way, was something that Brian Eno, who's on the board of my um, institute mentioned when I set up the commission for mission-oriented industrial strategy for Greg Clark. And I invited Brian to sit in in some of the meetings. He was like, I get it, I get it. And this is so great and inspirational. And I, I, I love hanging out with you guys, but why do you keep assuming people want to go places quicker? <laughs> What if they just want to actually look up every now and then and just experience life in a more, you know, a, a holistic and, a, and profound way? What does that mean for how you design public spaces, for how you design a public, you know, transport system and so on? And that was incredibly useful reminder, like, oh, yeah, right. I forgot. <laughs> anyway, so we've just actually set up, um, it's going to be launched soon, a UN Council on Urban Initiatives, which brings different mayors together from across the globe precisely to ask what does it mean for cities to think about the sustainable development targets at the center of how they think about transport, construction, social housing, you know, creativity, and so on. And there's so many interesting examples around the world from Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Colombia, which recently with Medellin, one of its cities, um, you know, had a whole Medellin Mas Educada, you know, Medellin is the most educated city in the world. That was their mission. And that kind of devised the 
the, the mayor's plan. But another thing we're doing with cities is working with the Bloomberg uh, Philanthropy Foundation and actually creating an executive education program on the back of our UCL MPA for public servants globally, which really starts to unpick the problematic education that public servants have had, including mayors, where again, at best, they've been told the role is to fix market failures. What does it look like to put value, a challenge-oriented approach, creative bureaucracies, design-centered solutions, citizen design-centered solutions at the center of how mayors see their own roles. And that's gonna be quite exciting. And that's gonna start with 10 global cities, again, across the continents. And the reason that's important is we can't just think that it's about better policy. We need, you know, as Che Guevara used to say, a new mind, a new man, a new woman. <laughs> um, so what does that look like in terms of the training, the curriculum, the thinking? We need to think about these things in a fundamentally different way. And that's what the book tries to do. Um. Mariana, it's always a great inspiration to, to have you involved in our events and to hear about your work. If you'd like to get a copy of uh, Mission Economy, it's available from our partners at Waterstones and, as they say, all good bookshops. Uh, we will post the links to previous events that we've run with Mariana um, on our website, plus uh, background reading and also some of the quotations we've used. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you most of all, Mariana Matsukatu. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks to Bristol Ideas.